Support for Knowledge Stream is provided in part by a generous gift from the Appold Family Charitable Trust. Uh, thanks for coming out on a Saturday morning to, to listen to this talk. This is a lot of fun, isn't it? To, to come and spend some time on a cold Saturday morning and talk a little bit of science. Um, so again, as John mentioned, my name is Drew Gornewalds. I work for the School for the Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. Um, and I actually just started there very recently. For about the past decade, I was working for NOAA in their Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, also in Ann Arbor, um, specifically doing research on the Great Lakes. So much of what I'm going to be sharing with you has to do with what I'm doing now and going to be continuing doing at the university, but also what we've been doing not just for the past decade at NOAA, but really building on decades of research there. Um, that focuses on the Great Lakes. And I like to start off a lot of my talks, by the way, in the back can you hear me? I've chosen not to use a mic, just, you guys can hear me okay? All right. Um, I've decided to start out with this slide because I like to emphasize the role that the Great Lakes play in sort of the national landscape. And I think this satellite image does a great job of portraying that, but I want to juxtapose this with a lot of the maps and the images that we grew up with many of them cut off right at the border between the U.S. and Canada, so that the ocean, Canada, the Gulf of Mexico, are all sometimes a sort of white blob. And I truly believe that that has had a significant impact on this country's understanding of the magnitude of the lakes, of our interaction with them, and the connection between the United States and Canada and the flow of water across the continent. So one of the things that I like to do when I give this talk is emphasize the magnitude of the lakes, the role they play, and certainly for folks that live right here, we need to know about this resource, we need to be experts in it, and we need to have a stake in the decisions that are made about it. So um, the title of my talk today is Water Resources Management, uh, and I'm, I'm bringing it to you from a Great Lakes perspective. So to cut right to the chase, when I talk about water resources management, here's what I mean. We're thinking about four important questions that have to do with water. Number one, what do we need water for in terms of quantity and quality here and now? Okay, in a particular place, in a particular time. Okay, the second of the four questions is what's available right here and right now in terms of quantity and quantity? Third question, what do we need water for, whether it's drinking or other things, in the future at a particular place and time? And the fourth and final question that really drives a lot of the science that we do what amount and what quality of water is going to be available at a particular place and time in the future. Water resources management is about the science that goes into answering those four questions and about the actions and the policies that are put in place to reconcile discrepancies between what we need water for and what it might be able to, what it might be able to provide at a particular place and time. So there are a lot of examples from around the world of water resources management. I'm gonna start off by giving you a few and bringing them uh, globally and then back to the Great Lakes. And then the scientific question that I wanna focus on today that relates to those four questions about water resources management is how do we know how much water there is in a particular place and time? I know that some folks have come and talked to you earlier about harmful algal blooms and water quality. Um, I could spend another two hours talking about water quality, but today, we're going to talk about understanding how do we understand the amount of available water at a given place and time, and we're going to use the Great Lakes as an example. Now, if we want to answer the question about what might happen with water in the future, particularly with regards to water quantity, we have to know what drives changes in water quantity at a particular place and time. And again, we're going to use the Great Lakes as an example of how we understand the things that drive water quantity at a particular place and time. And what I mean by this? is, and I'll give an example, there are lakes all around the world right now that are drying up. And unfortunately, the people that live in those regions don't have a comprehensive understanding as to why they're drying up. And they're fighting over whether or not it's agricultural use, whether or not it's climate change, whether or not it's diversions for drinking water. So the ability to understand what's driving changes in water quantity is absolutely imperative to that fourth water resources management question, how much water is there going to be in the future? And then I just want to leave you with some sort of fun final thoughts and questions um, that, that sort of keep, up, uh, keep us up at night and that you might find interesting as well. So just to talk a little bit more about what we mean by water resources management, one of the most obvious uses of water is drinking water supply. And if you think about those water resources management questions, when do we need water for drinking water? Well, in populated areas, all the time, 
right? There's not some sort of two-month hiatus where we, where we can go without drinking water, right? But is water at most places and times, particularly in populated areas, always available? Well, not necessarily. So what's the water resources management solution? Sometimes we build dams, like this one in Australia. So this is the Gordon Dam, and I'd like to show this particular image because I think it really underscores the magnitude of the management impact. So there's this deep canyon here, used to be free flowing. We build the dam, water backs up behind it, and for at least for a while, there's an adequate water supply. But there are questions here still about long-term sustainability, getting to that fourth question, how much water will there be in the future? Climate change, population migration, increased use can all change the paradigm here in terms of how much water is available. We don't have to go all the way around the world, though, to find examples of how we manage water for a particular resource. Uh, this is uh, an image of an iconic image of Niagara Falls, connecting Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. It's an enormous amount of water that passes over Niagara Falls. It's one of the highest continental flow rates um, all across North America. And I thought it'd be fun to talk a little bit about how Niagara Falls are used from a water resources management perspective. So the water, there's such a strong elevation drop across Niagara Falls that we can use that water to drive turbines for hydropower. And many folks don't, maybe haven't seen these two particular images. So on the left, we have a pretty cool, and I'm gonna re reference the center slide here with my laser pointer. So here's um, the sort of iconic Horseshoe Falls on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls. And then here are the American side of Niagara Falls. And we're looking downstream, so we're looking down here, down the Niagara River. What's really cool about this system from a water resources management perspective is that there are two huge diversions of water from just upstream of the Niagara Falls. One is a pipe that starts just about here and runs underground. If you can follow my pointer, it goes all the way down to a reservoir here that most people have never seen. And that reservoir, is the storage mechanism that ultimately drives the turbines for the New York Power Authority and Ontario Power Generation, and then ultimately provide power to much of upstate New York and southern Ontario. So the management question here is, when we need power, which is all the time, how are we gonna provide an adequate supply? The solution is by diverting water into these big pools and then periodically running it through turbines. And so if you look on this image here, here is one of those huge facilities. This is the Ontario Power Generation Facility on the Canadian side. Here's one of the storage reservoirs. The, the water elevation here goes down through a bunch of turbines and provides power. And just so you have a feel for where this is, if you look on this side on the right and follow this all the way upstream, see the mist right here? That's the falls. So that's sort of where we are relative to that facility. An absolutely fascinating water resources management uh, implementation here to get the water to meet our needs for hydropower. Um, here in the Great Lakes, we use water for uh, recreational and commercial boating. This is one of the really, really big commercial vessels that crisscross the Great Lakes. Um, this is on one of the locks on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, and one of the reasons this is a water resources management challenge is because this is a really narrow lock and it's also pretty shallow. So, we actually manage the water levels, and I'll talk about this more later. Um, there are management practices for the Great Lakes to ensure safe passage of this vessel here and in other places across the Great Lakes. Yet another example of a water resources management strategy. And then right around the corner here, this is the Fermi nuclear power plant. Most of you probably see this or recognize this, um, this image. And what's interesting about the nuclear power facility and other facilities is they also utilize the water. So here's the, the question is, what do you need water for at a particular place and time? Drinking, hydropower. Well, nuclear power facilities use it often for cooling, okay? So the reactors get hot, they draw on cool water from Lake Erie, run it around the reactors, water gets warm, reactors get cool, and then they discharge the water back. But they also need the water to be a certain elevation over time so that there's enough pressure on the pumps that draw the water in. And when water levels were low over the past decade or something, there was concern around the region that there wouldn't be enough water above those pumps to keep them running, particularly in light of changes in water elevation across Lake Erie. Let's talk about that a little bit more. 
So when we look at water levels on Lake Erie, for people who live on the shoreline or for nuclear power facilities, it becomes a question of where's the water going to be for what we need it for at a particular place in time. And if water is sloshing back and forth like this, that affects the answer to that question, doesn't it? So you're not missing anything. This is intentionally an empty slide. Um, when, I, when I unveil data sets, one of the things I like to do from a science communication perspective, and for those of you who are interested in be, being scientists or in school still, here's what I learned. To try to introduce complex data and stories in an order and at a level of complexity that your audience is likely to expect it. So one of the tricks that I was taught early on is to start off with an empty plot like this and make sure that there's a clear understanding of what we're about to look at and then unveil the data. Hopefully it works for you folks. So along the x-axis here, we're looking at October 2012, October 9th through the 31st, and then here and through early November. So we have a time series here. Again, I haven't put any data up. On the top panel, I'm going to show you water level data from the Great Lakes. And the label here says surface water elevation in meters relative to the IGLD-85. What the heck is IGLD? It stands for the International Great Lakes Datum. All the water level gauging stations in the Great Lakes have their own unique common reference point way down by the Atlantic Ocean. So that's the zero point in elevation, essentially, the Atlantic Ocean. And then all the elevations up here on the Great Lakes where we're about, oh, 175 meters above uh, the Atlantic Ocean are measured relative to that point, OK? On the bottom panel here, we have surface water elevation also in meters, but those are relative to mean sea level. And you'll see that both panels span a range of six meters. So we're comparing apples to apples here. Now, what major meteorological event am I probably going to talk about that was happening in the end of October 2012? Say that again? Drought. Not Well, there was a drought going on. And this particular event, and some people say, actually brought an end to some of the drought conditions. In the, I'm thinking of Hurricane Sandy. OK. And what I want to talk about here is the impact that Hurricane Sandy can have from a water resources management perspective. So here's, here's a satellite image of Hurricane Sandy. We all know about how Hurricane Sandy had a huge impact on the East Coast here, but what I want to talk about is the impact. Look at what Hurricane Sandy is doing to the eastern portion of the Great Lakes, and in particular, where we are right now. And look at the predominant wind direction here, wind coming down Lake Huron, crisscrossing Lake Erie. Think for a second about what that might be doing to the water resource in this area. And let's take a look at the data that was collected during that time. So here I've added to this uh, slide the time period when Hurricane Sandy was sort of at its peak. And then I'm going to add in a water level time series from one of the water level stations called Fort Gratiot. It's at the southern end of Lake Huron. And then I'm going to add in another water level gauge that's out at Buffalo, New York. Okay? And just for reference, Here's a map of the Great Lakes. So the Fort Gratiot gauge, if you look at the center panel, is right about here, the southern end of Lake Huron. And then, of course, the Buffalo gauge is over here. I can also add in, in the bottom panel here, the water level gauging station that was collected at the same time in New York City, OK, at Battery Park. And there's some pretty cool things going on here that I want to point out. The first is that you clearly see what's happening here at Battery Park. Water levels went up at this gauge by several meters. It's a lot of extra water. But what a lot of people don't know, take a look at what's happening at the southern end of Lake Huron right here. Water levels are going along, and they suddenly rise. Water levels at the southern end of Lake Huron at that gauge went up by about four to five feet. That's a lot of water, especially when you consider the fact that most of the water wasn't building up there. It was rippling down the St. Clair River. Okay, So that's an awful lot of water to cause the southern end of a lake to build up like that. Interesting impact of the hurricane. Now, the other thing we see here is that there's um, this tidal variability at Battery Park. Tides are, uh, that's a lot of water level variability. But I would argue tides are relatively predictable. OK, they're pretty consistent. What's not consistent or predictable are the spikes you see here across Lake Erie. And these are those seiche events I'm talking about. These are a meteorological phenomenon. When there's a significant windstorm that comes across the lake, typically from west to east, the water levels, if you're looking at Lake Erie in a cross section, for you folks, Buffalo this way, 
we're this way. But the water levels of Buffalo will rise up because of the wind. And as soon as the wind subsides, the lakes will slosh back and forth. You folks probably know this and have experienced it. Well, take a look at the magnitude of these seiche events relative to these tide events. Pretty close, more dangerous, and less predictable. Okay? And almost on the same order of magnitude as the impact of Hurricane Sandy, but these are not associated with Hurricane Sandy whatsoever. So these kind of things we think about when we are trying to understand what's happening with the water around us and to answer those questions from a water resources management perspective. Okay, a few other examples of water resources management. I love this picture. This is from a project that we did for, I don't know, have any of you folks been to Apostle Islands um, on Lake Superior? So um, in what along the Wisconsin shoreline in southwestern Lake Superior, there are these beautiful caves and shorelines and in the winter when they freeze, you can walk out on the ice and access these beautiful caves. Totally cool, yet another water resource, when the water's frozen, from a recreational perspective. The management question, of course, here is, when is the water frozen enough for people to safely do this, and when is it not? And in fact, the project that we did stemmed directly from that question. The park managers here wanted to know, in the future, in response to climate change, when is ice gonna form, if at all, along this particular shoreline? So really interesting uh, water resources management question there. We ask, we expect water to harvest food for us. This is an image from North Carolina in a shellfish harvesting area. And this is where we're gonna start first talking or continuing to talk about conflicts with water resources management. Why is this particular area closed? Because there is a management policy put in place determining sort of when the water is not of a sufficient quantity or quality to meet the needs we asked of it. In this particular case, we wanted to harvest shellfish that we, can, that we can eat, but when the water quality isn't good enough, we shut it down for a while. And there are other examples of this, of course, even here in the Great Lakes. This is an image of um, the Grand River discharging a plume of sediment, and unfortunately, probably a lot of other pollutants right outside Grand Haven. We ask a lot of water resources, one of which is to dilute and carry away a lot of the pollutants we generate on the landscape. And then finally, I mentioned earlier with regard to climate change, this is an image taken at the exact same time as the other image along the Apostle Islands, but more recently, um, when ice is really not forming, it's breaking up and not nearly providing the same resource that it was earlier from a recreational perspective. Okay, and I talked earlier about uh, lakes around the world drying up, but I wanna go to one specific example so this is from a paper that was published about Lake Chad, and I wanna show you the demise of one of the largest lakes on Earth. Now keep in mind here, this left-hand image is from the 1950s. It's a satellite image superimposed on the original shoreline perimeter of Lake Chad. We're looking at 24,000 square kilometers of surface area of lake here. Over the next 50 to 60 years, the lake has diminished and now it's an order of magnitude less at 1,300 square kilometers. And part of why this happened is because there wasn't a clear understanding of what was happening um, in terms of driving the water loss across the system. So let's take a look at um, water around the world here. Many of you have seen in probably a slide like this before, but I wanna put the amount of water that's in the Great Lakes into perspective for you from a global, on a global scale. So this top slide here represents all the water on Earth, okay? 97.5% of that is in the ocean, salt water, and a sliver, 2.5% of all the water on Earth is fresh water. And if we further subdivide all the fresh water up, most of it, about 80% of it, is in ice caps and glaciers. It's not really the kind of thing you can sort of stick a tube into and drink or use. And 20% of it, is in groundwater, really hard to get. Deep aquifers, you can pump it out, but it's not readily accessible. It's a lot harder to get to. So 1% of that 2.5% is sort of what we might call non-captured uh, in, in groundwater and ice. Well, let's break that up even further. That small percent, about half of that is in lakes around the world. A very small sliver is in rivers. A lot of it is in us and other living organisms, um, and a bunch of it is in soil. So take a look here at the amount of water, fresh water, of what very little is actually available from the overall global water percentage, 
What I want to talk about next is how much of that water is actually in the Great Lakes. And this slide provides an answer to that. So this is a table that we put together that shows the largest lakes on Earth ranked by surface area. So here we have um, the name of a lake, the country or the countries in which that lake resides, surface areas, both in kilometers squared and miles squared, and then volume here. Remember, does anybody remember what the original surface area of Lake Chad was back in the 1950s? 27,000. So it used to be on this list right here. And now it's gone. Um, the Aral Sea used to be on here as well. So here is a ranking of all the uh, large lakes on Earth by surface area. Here is the corresponding volume. When I highlight the lakes that make up the Great Lakes, we see some interesting patterns. And I do want to point out here, many of you might be asking, why did you put Lake Michigan and Lake Huron together? From a long-term hydrology perspective, we really think of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron as being one large lake because of the Straits of Mackinac. Um, certainly on short time scales, different things happen in each lake, but over long time periods, the surface level of both are about the same, okay? So that's, in an image like this, that's why we put them together. So from that perspective, Lake Michigan, Huron, largest lake on Earth by far. Lake Superior, second largest lake by surface area by far. Lake Victoria comes in third here, and then here we have Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. But what I want to point out is remember that half of that sort of fresh surface water we consider available was in lakes. Half of all that lake water is in three systems across the entire Earth. One of those systems is Lake Baikal, right here. The second is Lake Tanganyika. And the third is the collective volume of the Great Lakes. So again, of all the water distributed across all the lakes on Earth, essentially three systems comprise half of that lake water. When you think about that, you cannot overemphasize the importance of understanding the role the Great Lakes play in the global water supply, and more importantly, what a luxury we have for the science and the technology and the investment we have in understanding the Great Lakes and how we should be using that and extrapolating outwards to help other water bodies understand where their water is going and where their water is going to be in the future. Any questions so far? Could you go back to your last graphic? I could go back. I can easily go back to my last graphic. This one? Oh, right. I'm going forward. Sorry. Okay. Measurements by satellite, I assume. Oh, measurements of these? Wow. How long do you want to stay around? <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna so we're gonna talk the next the next section of the talk is how we measure water abundance, how we measure. In general though, on a global scale, absolutely. Okay, so the GRACE mission, G R A C A mission, is responsible for most of our understanding of global water, um, particularly surface water and groundwater elevations around the world. But that's actually a really good question. This is a composite of a lot of research uh, uh, from all around the world. Great question. Let's talk a little bit, follow up on this gentleman's question, though, about water quantity, how we understand water abundance. And again, I want to use the Great Lakes as an example. One of the best ways we keep track of the volume of the Great Lakes is um, we do have satellite information available. But in the Great Lakes, we have a broad network of water level monitoring stations, like this one. This is a water level gauge in Mackinac City. There's about 50, a little bit over 50 of these on the US shoreline of the Great Lakes and about a little over half that many on the Canadian shoreline. So 80 water level gauging stations all around the Great Lakes. Just to put it in perspective, there's really no other lake or freshwater system like on Earth that has that many water level gauging stations. These were put in back in the, initially back in the mid 1800s, early 1900s to help with navigation up the St. Lawrence Seaway and then through the Great Lakes when navigation in this part of the country was absolutely pivotal to the country's growth. Army Corps of Engineers, commercial pilots really, really needed to know the lake levels. And we benefit in a lot of ways from that legacy. When we put all that data together, whoo here's what we get. We have really an unprecedented long-term record of water levels for one of the most massive lake systems on Earth. So what we're looking at here is a time series if, uh, if I use my laser point on the central panel hill going back to the early 1900s all the way to present, on the y-axis here I have water surface elevation again in meters, 
And then I have the four different lake systems. So Lake Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, and Ontario. The light blue dots that you see are monthly average water levels. And if you squint real hard or you look closely, you can see that there is a really strong seasonal pattern to monthly water levels across all the lakes. In the springtime, water levels go up because snow across the region is melting and contributing water. In the fall, water levels across lakes typically go down because of increased evaporation. Okay, so that sort of drives the seasonal cycle. The black dots that you see are the annual average water level, and then the red line in each panel is the long-term average. So you can see a lot of water level ups and downs. I also want to point out from a water resources management perspective that many people don't know this, but I think everyone should. In the 1920s, there were what we call construction works or control works put near Sault Ste. Marie to help regulate the flow out of Lake Superior. Lake Superior is essentially the largest dam on Earth. Uh, but a lot of people don't know that. Now, there's limited control on the outflow of Lake Superior, but there is a structure there that helps regulate the flow out. Now, even more important, in the early 1960s, the Moses Saunders Dam was installed on the outlet of Lake Ontario. And this is a really big deal. Um, this was put in place to help regulate water levels, minimize flooding, and minima minimize low water levels for the St. Lawrence Seaway. Remember that picture I showed of the vessel coming up before? So we want to make sure water levels don't get too low for ships or too high for homes. And you can see the impact of the dam. Look at the variability in water levels in Lake Ontario before the dam and then after the dam. So there's really a profound difference here. On a side note, some people call that dam one of the biggest ecological disasters of the Great Lakes because it completely changed the rate at which wetlands dry and wet on an interannual basis. And this is a major bird migration uh, area really changed a lot of things about the ecosystem that ended up being detrimental. Okay. So a few time periods I want to highlight here. Um, in the mid-1960s, water levels across the Great Lakes were extremely low. Uh, if you wait a few decades, water levels on the Great Lakes got extremely high. And just take a look for perspective here at the magnitude of the difference between water levels at this point in time on Lake Michigan and Lake Huron and this time. We're looking at a two meter difference in water levels, about six feet or so. That's an awful lot of difference in water level that this region has essentially adapted to uh, over time. Many of you might remember in the late 1990s, water levels declined precipitously across the region. And then very, very recently, right at the period where we were almost in the midst of a water level crisis. Um, there are a lot of questions being raised about where water levels uh, from the Great Lakes were going. Was climate change going to continue to draw the Great Lakes down? There was an unbelievable rebound in Great Lakes. In fact, the rate of rise that you see there in, in the Great Lakes water levels across the system set a record. Highest rate of water level rise in the entire historical record. Never had water levels risen that quickly before. And if you're curious, we can talk about why afterwards. Um, but what I do want to point out from a water management perspective, Lake Ontario here, was supposed to be, or is supposed to be managed well, right? Through this dam. The conditions that brought about this water level surge exceeded the ability to manage that water. And I wanna show you sort of a science plot here, but this is a real data plot that NOAA puts together for one of the water level gauges on uh, Lake Ontario. So on the bottom axis here, we're showing sort of a representative year here from January through December. And then you see a bunch of different lines on here. This is for this one water level gauge. These brown lines represent the lowest water level ever recorded at that gauge for each month of the year. Okay? Correspondingly, if you can see this light blue line, that's the highest water level that was ever recorded at that gauge for each one of those months over time. Let me focus your attention. This black line here was the daily water level at that gauge in the year 2016, so from January to December 2016. In 2017, we have this other line superimposed on it. You can see for a while, water levels were following the typical pattern, and then whew, water levels went up by about three feet here over the course of just a couple months on Lake Ontario. And a lot of that has to do with changes in snowpack across the region, tremendous storms, much of which were actually going across Canada through the Ottawa River but affected how we manage Lake Ontario, okay? 
This caught a lot of people off guard. It was not part of the question of where do we need the water to be in the future and how much water is there going to be in the future. Somebody didn't match up those two questions in this management scheme. I'm not saying it was easy to do so, but that's what happened. Uh, and you can see, I don't know if you, many of you know the story, but it was all over the news. New York Times um, ran several stories on this. Thousands of homes in Montreal had to be evacuated. On the right-hand side here, this is a woman from upstate New York pleading to Governor Cuomo. And essentially what he is asking, what she is asking him to do is change water management policy. She is asking him to get the water out of Lake Ontario to stop flooding her house and send it downstream to Montreal, where unfortunately the conditions look like this. Okay, really a fascinating water resources management problem right here in our backyard effectively. Okay, so let's shift gears here. If we're gonna answer questions like the Lake Ontario question about what are water levels or how much water is there gonna be in the future, we gotta know where it comes from and we gotta know how it moves through the system. And this is true for any freshwater system on Earth. Let's break it down for the Great Lakes and, and talk a little about where water comes from for this particular system. Okay, any questions? Anyone want to go back a slide and take a picture? Okay, all right, so this is a satellite image of, of the Great Lakes, and I love these sort of aerial photos because they provide unique perspective. This image of the Great Lakes, I think, underscores the complexity of the climate and the meteorological system that are driving the flow of water across the whole domain. So uh, here we have Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, of course, Lake Huron is kind of hidden. This is a late fall, early winter photograph showing you several things that are relative, that are important for water abundance. On the land, we've got a lot of snow, and that snow is going to melt and provide water to us, but we're also losing water here through evaporation. This is the time of year when cold, dry air comes sweeping across the Great Lakes. The lakes are kind of cooling down, and as the lakes cool down, they actually transmit water vapor up into the atmosphere, and that water vapor gets carried across and away from the lake. All these are important to the regional water abundance question. And anecdotally, they're also important from a human health and safety perspective. So this is an image um, that we did some research on. This is the Buffalo snowstorm, lake effect snowstorm, um, down on the other end of the lake, right? Um, November 2014, many of you remember this, about five feet of snow built up uh, due to the snowstorm. And here's, I love this image. This is an image of that snowstorm literally barreling its way towards Buffalo, getting ready to start dump some snow on the region. I don't have to tell many people in this room, but I do often include in my talk the idea of the snow belt here. Um, an interesting story that USA Today ran had to look at wintertime car accidents. Um, and these, uh, this story didn't point to it, but um, you know, this is really a direct consequence of the climate in which we live in this region here and the interaction between the lakes and the atmosphere and the land surface. Um, all of which is sort of an interesting um, byproduct of this water resources management question. All right, so let's talk briefly. Here's something I want everyone in the region to know about is where the water in the Great Lakes comes from and where it goes to. All right, so here's this image of the Great Lakes. Within each one of the Great Lakes, there are three principal drivers of changes in the amount of water. There is runoff. That's the amount of water that comes into each lake through all the rivers and streams that flow in, and I represent that here by the color green, okay? The second is over lake precipitation, okay? That's the amount of precipitation and rainfall that falls directly onto the surface of the lake. Quick side note, there are very few freshwater systems on Earth for which that's a concern. But because, because the Great Lakes are so big, the surface area is a big collection bucket. So the amount of over lake precipitation is massive. And then the third major component here is over lake evaporation. So three major components. To put those in perspective, let's take a look at Lake Superior here. These bar plots are trying to show the average annual amount of water that enters and leaves through each one of those three components. So here's sort of an x-axis right here. Water coming in from runoff I have the number 1.6 here. That's in thousands of cubic meters per second. So it's about 1,600 cubic meters per second of flow on average. To put that in perspective, when the Mississippi River 
reaches its discharge down in the Gulf of Mexico, it's at about 16,000 cubic meters per second. Okay, so one order of magnitude less than that, just from rivers and streams coming into Lake, uh, Lake Superior, a tremendous amount of water. But the amount of water that comes in through rainfall on the surface of the lake is even more than that. 2,000 cubic meters per second of water on average throughout the year. Okay? There are, again, there are very few systems on Earth for which the amount of direct precipitation on the water is more than what comes in through all the rivers and streams. And then finally, here's the amount of water lost through evaporation on Lake Superior, about 1,400 cubic meters per second. And you can see the numbers um, for the other lakes as well. What I want to talk about here as we get close to wrapping things up is um, this gentleman asked, how do we know these numbers? Well, it differs around the world, but just some quick examples of how we collect data about precipitation evaporation runoff. So has anybody seen one of these before? Does anybody know what this is? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is a tipping bucket rain gauge, although it really is just like a bucket. Um, this is the casing for a tipping bucket rain gauge. These are very simple technology, but these are deployed all around the world at meteorological stations. Water comes into the top, and if you're going to take the lid off of one of these tipping bucket rain gauges, you literally see a tipping bucket. Um, this right here is a small sort of piece of plastic, and this space right here has a pre-known volume. So water comes in through this funnel, fills up this bucket, and when that bucket gets full, the entire mechanism tips. Water goes out, and then water starts filling up this side. And what this mechanism does is it counts the number of times that the bucket goes back and forth during a rainstorm. And because it knows the volume in each bucket, it can do a pretty good job of calculating the total amount of, of rain that came in. Again, these are deployed all over the world. This is a very common, uh, simple, but effective technology. OK. Now, there are a lot of other ways we collect precipitation data, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for one of them. For evaporation, it used to be very common to use a mechanism called pan evaporation, where people actually literally put a pan of water out somewhere and measure how much water evaporated. A lot of problems with that. There are variabil there's variability in temperature of what's in the pan versus the water body you're trying to really estimate evaporation from and other things. One of the newest technologies that you might hear about is called eddy covariance. Okay, and what eddy covariance systems literally do is if you look at what's happening on the screen here, there's a predominant wind pattern represented by this big arrow. And then all these little circles in here represent little wind patterns called eddies. And there are, um, we have meteorological stations that can measure the three-dimensional direction of the wind, of these eddies, and determine how much water vapor is in those little wind patterns and whether or not water vapor is moving up or moving down which essentially gives us an idea of evaporation. This is a complex technology, but it's being deployed all around the world, and we use it here in the Great Lakes. In fact, I'm going to skip over this slide for right now. One of the exciting things we've been doing is these eddy covariance systems. They're pretty expensive, and they're, and they're pretty sophisticated, but we've been deploying them all across the Great Lakes on old abandoned lighthouses. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen this lighthouse on um, Michigan license plates. This is the White Shoal Lighthouse. It's sort of an iconic um, image. But it's up in the middle of northern Lake Michigan. It's the perfect place for a weather station. And about 10 years ago, I worked with a team to actually install one of them um, right here at the top. We sometimes joke that this would be a great place for a winter internship program for a bunch of students. Um, but unfortunately, that would be illegal and it would violate OSHA requirements and that sort of thing. Um, it actually is a, a very, very harsh environment. Um, it is pretty unsafe. These lighthouses have been there for 150 years, but it's, a, it's a, one of the best freshwater research platforms on Earth. Uh, and just in case you're wondering, this is where those evaporation stations are right now. One of them is on a channel marker just offshore from where we are right now. That was put in just about a year ago to help us better understand evaporation from the Great Lakes. One of the more recent things that I'm excited about is um, uh, over an adult beverage in Chicago with some colleagues, um, we were talking about ways to improve and understanding the Great Lakes. And one of my colleagues who's connected with the shipping industry said, hey, Drew, what could, what could we do? What would be really cool? What would be a really cool way to advance science in the Great Lakes? And I spontaneously answered, if we could get eddy covariance systems, these evaporation systems, on those commercial vessels that crisscross the Great Lakes all the time, that would be awesome. He made a phone call, 
and within a few months we were installing one of them on the bow of the Whitefish Bay. This is that vessel and I actually took this during a recent scientific conference on the Detroit River and on the bow right up here is our eddy covariance system measuring evaporation all across the Great Lakes. Um, really right up until the ice season and as soon as the ice season um, is over they're collecting measurements again with us. Yeah, sure. Absolutely, yeah. There, yeah, well, though, when, there's no tur when there's very little turbulence, you have very little evaporation. Yep, exactly. Great question, yep. Yeah, so like a horizontal wind shear without a lot of turbulent action isn't going to really, um, you really do need that turbulent action along the, along the vertical boundary layer there. <laughs> great, great, absolutely, great question. So there, so it does involve creaking, and actually, you can you can for about eight thousand dollars, you can buy a little chip that you can put inside one of these as a sensor that will auto correct for not just um, not just the overall vessel, you know, movement of the vessel, but wind. Um, and even minor variations in the boat's movement. In fact, the mast actually does this periodically, and this little sensor even corrects for those movements as well. Great, great question. Yeah, great question. It's amazing what you can get for $8,000 and solve all these problems, right? Um, and I, I should point out that that technology um, is used uh, quite extensively in the Pacific to understand El Nino and surface temperatures um, along the Pacific Ocean. But this is the first time it's been used in the Great Lakes in this way on a vessel. But so there is a lot of technology used in the Pacific that we were leveraging. I have one more. Yeah, sure. Question. Yeah. It's critical. It's absolutely critical because the way that those right along right along the, the layer of the lake, there's very little turbulence and there's very little um, you know wind action. And as you go up in elevation, um, it completely changes that dynamic. So. So we try to get the sensor as high off the water as possible. Um, and then more importantly, we need to know exactly how high it is so we can provide a vertical adjustment or a corrector to whatever measurements we get. Because it's almost impossible to get all the sensors at exactly the same height. Like some are on lighthouses that are 120 feet off and some are on a boat, but so great question. We try to get as high as possible. Okay, I know we're getting close to the end here. Um, how are we doing on energy and time? We okay for a few more, a few more minutes? Okay. So we talked about precipitation measurement, we talked about evaporation measurement, and then this last slide I wanna show you has to do with how we typically collect measurements of runoff. So many of you might have seen a stream gauge, uh, many of you might have not, but the primary agency in the United States responsible for collecting stream flow measurements is the United States Geological Survey. And this is an image, a, a typical image of what one of their stream gauges looks like. So just to walk you through here, I know the lettering isn't clear, here's a little housing station so here's a cross section of a stream, here's the stream flowing down, here's the bottom of the stream. This blue line right here is the surface water and groundwater elevation. The thing I wanna point out in this slide is that within this housing station, the way, the typical way these gauging stations work um, is by measuring not the flow through the river, but by the elevation in the river or the depth of the river. And the way these stations have evolved is there's actually a little tube that runs from the station with a pump. And the job of the little pump right here is to make sure that it is continuously pushing air out of that tube. The higher the water level gets or the deeper the river gets, the harder it is for that pump to push air out. So there's actually a little sensor in there that can help understand the pressure that's needed to push water out of that tube. And the USGS has a whole litany of history about the relationship between the pressure that is needed to keep water flowing through that tube, the height of the depth of the river, and the corresponding flow. This is sort of the fundamental technology that's in a lot of these monitoring stations. Um, but what makes this really sort of magical is that as this data is collected, it's being transmitted by satellite. So if you go to USGS's website and click on a gauge near you, um, sort of gauge on the MAMI, you're getting real-time data all across the country through these stations. It's really a remarkable resource. So between rain gauges, between evaporation stations, between stream flow gauges like this, we can put together a comprehensive picture that leads us to that image I showed earlier about where the water is at a particular time. Now you can imagine there are enormous uncertainties, not just here in the Great Lakes, but certainly in areas where these measurements and these monitoring stations are sparse. 
Um, that's something we can talk about at another time. Okay, I'm gonna move forward here so and wrap things up and then I'll have time for questions. So just a few final thoughts here. Um, one of the questions I would pose to you are, is, what's your thought about historical data? Is it important to have a data record? If we're thinking about the future, what's the value of long-term data records for an area like the Great Lakes? From our, they go ahead. You can understand cycles, absolutely. Helps you anticipate, absolutely. Other thoughts? It helps you understand variability, absolutely. One of the reasons I like to show that water level plot is because I found that through nobody's individual fault in the Great Lakes, there's often sort of about a two year memory of water levels. Um, water levels are really high right now. Water levels are really low right now. But it's amazing the reaction you get when you show the long-term water level record that it's really been going up and down and up and down for quite a long time. And essentially, if you wait enough, uh, it'll go up and down again. Yeah? You also wouldn't know the, the effects of a change. Absolutely. If you put a dam in, or you remove a dam, or any change that you make, or build a city, yep. or increase the population, you wouldn't know what the effect is if you didn't have historical data. Absolutely, absolutely. And in water quality, there's a common term for this, which is post-implementation monitoring, or post-management monitoring. You recognize that there's a management intervention or an action or a policy needed. You put it in place, but then it's really important to keep collecting data to determine whether or not that management act action was actually effective in remedying the problem it was set out to. Uh, Control the reaction. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a great point. Yes. Kind of a thought on your question, but I was just you were talking about those monitoring systems in the previous slide, and is that how they are? Those the systems that are used to determine uh, the high levels of flood as as water is moving down a river. You know, like what is that? Is that the system? That's so I can skip back a little bit. So So typically when we define sort of historical flood elevations or things like a 100 year return period or 50 year flood which I think is kind of what you're asking about. Well, actually I'm asking if, you know it's been like there's a huge rainstorm yep. down around Fort Wayne. Yep. Oh, 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 okay, yeah. Perfect segue, well, it's, well, it's, it's so, um, it's a perfect segue to the next question here. So, what's the value of the historical record? One thing the historical record can't directly tell us is what's going to happen tomorrow, right. right? You can try to discern patterns from the historical record, but any anomaly, any variation in the relationships we see in the historical record make it really hard to say it'll happen tomorrow. With tides, with tides, you can almost say, hey, I've been tracking the tides like this, and I'm pretty darn sure that for the next three hours it's going to go up, and unless there's a storm, it's not going to get much higher. But for things like a surge like you're talking about, we need models. So the answer to your question is computer models um, are passing a lot of the information along. Now, you may have enough real-time, what we would call data-driven or empirical evidence that the surge is coming by water level stations, and you can do some calculation about when it's going to hit the next one. I would argue even a simple calculation like that that says, well, here's the width of the river, here's its depth, here's what's happening with the wave, that calculation about where it's going to happen next, that's a model. Okay? It may not be a sophisticated computer model like the one I'm alluded to here, but that is a model and it's a forecast. And in order to make a good forecast, you have to have historical data to tell you about all the relationships between the river, the, the passage of that, that, that wave, and that sort of thing. Um, so the second question I would pose to you is, as agencies like NOAA and as scientists like my colleague, um, Dr. Song Chen in the back here, develop more complex models over time, 
can complex models replace observations? This is a real question. This is not just food for thought. It's expensive to put those sensors out in rivers. It's expensive to put eddy covariant systems out there. What would it take? What do you guys think it would take for a computer model that can simulate evaporation over the entire grid? What would it take to say that's enough? That's all we need. Think it's feasible? No, we need validation. Absolutely. This gentleman says we need validation. What do you think? Would you be convinced after, let's say you had a year of data. Let's say we ran a model for a year. We compared it to validation data for a year. And then somebody said, let's get rid of the stations. We don't have money for it anymore. The model's good enough. There's too many unknowns. There's a lot of unknowns. Too many. I mean, you don't, they're unknowns. So you don't know. You don't, you don't know if the cloud is there. Yep. That makes it darker. <laughs> I'll go to the gentleman in the back here and then, yeah. So these, um, these are all great questions. Part of why I'm not answering them is I'm posing them because these are the questions that keep us up as, at night as modelers and scientists. So just to, the, trying to accommodate climate change in models that have only been validated and conditioned against conditions in the past is one of the greatest changes we face. And in fact, if we got into a talk here about future water levels in the Great Lakes, holy smokes, this is a huge, uh, a very controversial topic because guess what's gonna happen in the future around here? It's going to get wetter and warmer. More rain and more evaporation. How do, we, how do we contrast those two from a water level perspective? It's tricky. Great question. Yeah? Well, I think you'd still want to be observing your, your inputs to your model to see if, all right, now your model is going to flag if the things are getting a little wacky here. Yep, absolutely. So here, here's the point I want to make for everybody, and then we can get close to wrapping things up depending on our time. Um, we as scientists, love having data <laughs> uh, and I'm sure we all do as citizens in general and we love having data that's being collected simultaneously with our models unfortunately there's a reality of limited resources and at some point we have to decide how much data is enough or where can we distribute our limited resources in terms of funding and money towards these and that's actually a really compelling question from a scientific perspective where can we put these monitoring locations to maximize our ability to minimize, to maximize our ability to minimize uncertainty about the system. That's a question we get asked a lot, and it's a pretty cool one. But you gotta study your math and your statistics for those of you who are still in school. <laughs> one final question here, specifically for this group. This is a question that does keep me up at night. What do we want from the Great Lakes 20 years from now? Do we want it to look like Lake Chad? Do we want it to continue? Do we want it to be less variable? Do we want to know exactly how high water levels are going to get but no higher and exactly how low they're going to get but no lower? That's a real demand. People have imposed that on Lake Michigan, Lake Huron through controls. You folks know this probably there are, and there may be folks in this room and I'm not judging who, who say let's, let's regulate the entire Great Lakes system just like Lake Ontario so we don't have flooding anymore, and we don't have water scarcity anymore. That's a, that's a dam. That's a controlled system. It happens all around the world. But I think I want to leave with this question right here. And if folks want to talk about it, we can. But that's the final question that I would pose is, what do, what do we want from the Great Lakes 20 years from now? And what actions and policies should we be putting place in here right now to make sure that those needs are met in the future? So I'll stop with that. And I'll you know, um, thank you for your time and attention. Um, and we can go into questions, I guess, if that's, yeah, yeah. Support for Knowledge Stream is provided in part by a generous gift from the Appold Family Charitable Trust.